We just want to bring you a message from our sponsor, Established Titles. I don't know if you know, but recently I gained a new title. I'm now known as Lord Criminally Listed. Whenever I return home, I announce, The Lord has arrived. Bring me libations post-haste. At the end of the day, I say, The Lord wants his feet rubbed. And now my family says that the Lord should chill out, or he'll be looking for a new kingdom. Okay, I'm kidding about being tossed out of my home, but it is 100% true that I'm a lord. Here's the certificate that shows it. I became a lord thanks to our amazing sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is a fun project based on the historic Scottish custom where landowners are called lairds, or lords and ladies in English. With Established Titles, you buy one square foot of dedicated land in Scotland, and then you get the title of lord or lady. It makes for a great, unique gift. You can even make your pet a lord or a lady. It's also a green purchase because they play a tree with every order. They work to support reforestation efforts around the world with the charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. With the title of lord or lady, you can actually add it to your plane tickets or credit cards. It might also help you get a date when you put it on your dating profile. What I thought was really cool is that the first 200 people to purchase a lot using my code will be placed near my plot. So we'll be able to make our little channel into a kingdom. Established Titles also makes for an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code criminally listed, you'll get 10% off. So go to EstablishedTitles.com slash criminally listed to get your titles now and help support criminally listing the process. Number 3. Margaret Rule Margaret Rule was born in November 1969. His grandparents raised him in Corpus Christi, Texas. Tragically, his mother died of an aneurysm before his first birthday. When his mother died, his father was stationed elsewhere in the army. The younger Rule took honor classes in high school. But during his teen years, he started committing petty crimes. His crimes escalated as he got older. When he was 16, he robbed a bank. Although he was unarmed, he handed a teller a note saying he had a gun. She gave him $2,500 from the till. He then walked away from the bank. A short time later, he robbed the same bank. Afterward, his friend turned him in. Guru only got probation. After high school, Guru got a job at the Corpus Christi State School where he cared for patients with intellectual disabilities. On the night of October 12, 1992, 22-year-old Martin Guru went to the UNI restaurant, a Greek diner in Corpus Christi, after it had closed. His girlfriend, 23-year-old Melissa Smith, had worked as a cashier at the restaurant but she had been fired for cash irregularities. When Guru went inside, Smith stayed in the car. Inside the restaurant, Guru rounded up one of the co-owners, Mike Perpipres, and the custodian, 31-year-old Tony Stadden. He took them to the back room and removed $9,000 from the safe. He then executed both men by shooting them once in the head. When the police investigated, they learned that the bullets were fired from a Colt Delta Elite handgun. Only a few people living in Corpus Christi owned that type of gun. One of them was Martin Guru, and the police learned he had a connection to the diner because of his girlfriend. They searched his house and found the murder weapon and some of the stolen money. Him and Melissa Smith were arrested and charged with murder. Guru went to trial in June 1993. He testified on his own behalf and he had an unusual story about what happened. He claimed he knew that Mike Propiparis was cheating the IRS. Propiparis asked him to come to his office so he could convince him not to report him for tax evasion. He said that Propiparis attacked him and the gun accidentally went off. The prosecution pointed out that no evidence backed up his version of events. It was clear that both men were shot execution style after a robbery. On June 28, 1993, 
Krill was found guilty of capital murder. The next day, he was sentenced to death. Krill was sent to death row at the O.B. Alice unit in Huntsville, Texas. For her part in the crime, Krill's girlfriend, Melissa Smith, was sentenced to 25 years in prison. At the beginning of his sentence, Grewal spent 23 hours a day in his cell. Other than handcuffs and shackles, he got an hour to shower and exercise every day. But then, Grewal was selected for the Work Capable program, which allowed supervised work with non-death row inmates. He worked as a custodian. He appealed to have his sentence overturned and was denied in 1997. Gruel really did not want to die by lethal injection. Not only did he not want to die, but he also had a phobia of needles. By the autumn of 1998, Gruel had been sitting on death row for about five years. November 26, 1998 was Thanksgiving. That day, 29-year-old Martin Gruel and six other inmates placed bed sheets and pillows on their beds under blankets to make it look like they were sleeping in their cells. After a Thanksgiving dinner, the seven inmates hid in the recreation room. They used black felt tip markers to darken their prison uniforms and long underwear. They also wrapped newspaper and cardboard around their chest to protect them from the fences, razor wire. After lights out, the men escaped from the recreation room and cut through a separating fence with a hacksaw. Once they reached the prison's main yard, they ran to the chapel. The chapel had a sloped roof. They were going to climb over the chapel, then scale a fence on the other side. They hid there and waited for complete darkness and for the fog to roll in. Inside the prison, at lights out, the guards were fooled by the bedsheets and pillows. At 12.20 a.m., some guards saw the inmates climb over and jump off the chapel roof, so they sounded the alarm. Six of the inmates immediately surrendered after hearing shots fired. Margarul kept running. He scaled two razor-wired fences as the guards fired off 18 to 20 shots. One shot grazed his back. He was also wounded from climbing the razor-wired fence. He fell to the ground on the other side of the fence and ran off into the darkness. The correctional officers didn't see any blood on the exterior fence. Police dogs lost his scent on a nearby road. A manhunt began and it became the largest manhunt in Texas history. More than 500 officers from the surrounding area took part in the hunt for the escapee. Officers stood side by side scanning an eight-mile radius around the prison. They figured the thick forest surrounding the prison would slow him down. Dogs, boats, and helicopters equipped with heat-sensing technology were used. The authorities described Gruel as dangerous, but they didn't suspect him of being armed. Texas Governor George W. Bush requested additional support from the Texas Rangers and announced a $5,000 reward for information leading to Gruel's capture. The manhunt continued for seven days and gained national attention. Reported sightings came from across the state. Melissa Smith, Gruel's former girlfriend and murder accomplice, who was still in prison, told the television show America's Most Wanted that she hopes he makes it. Prison inmates gathered around radios and television hoping for the latest news on Gruel. Officers even staked out Gruel's grandmother's home in Corpus Christi in case he showed up. Alan Polonsky, the chairman of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice, said that prison officials intended to bring Mr. Gruel back, dead or alive. It really doesn't make any difference, in my opinion, which it'll be. On December 3rd, eight days after he escaped, Two off-duty officers saw two ants floating above the water as they fished in the Trinity River. When they moved closer to the lifeless body, they used a gaff to lift the man's head. They had a good idea who it was. 
The two men tied a rope around his wrist and called the police. They identified the body as Martin Garul. He was still wearing his prison uniform and two layers of long johns. He had also wrapped newspaper and cardboard around his chest. The examiner ruled the cause of death as drowning. The gunshot he received on the back was considered superficial. His death was also backdated to November 27th, meaning he died on the night of his escape. Investigators suspect he died because his injuries made it hard for him to climb out of the river. The extra layer of newspaper and cardboard had excess weight as he tried swimming. As a result of Gruel's escape, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice moved their death row to Polk County. The work capable program was also discontinued. More restrictions, such as inmates being issued one uniform and banning carbon paper, were implemented on prisoners. Mark Gruel was the first Texas death row inmate to escape since Bonnie Clyde's gang broke out Floyd Hamilton in 1934. Number 2. Robert Fieldmore Lewis Robert Fieldmore Lewis was born in 1947 in Jacksonville, Florida. As a child, Lewis looked up to Robin Hood. He had a romantic notion of the folk hero. Growing up with little adult supervision, Lewis would find himself in and out of Florida's juvenile detention centers. In the mid-1970s, Lewis specialized in drug rip-offs and robbing businesses. On the night of January 27, 1976, 78-year-old Lewis, along with Eddie Odom and Charles Carter, pulled up to a house in a bright pink Chevrolet van. The Jacksonville house belonged to 46-year-old Joseph Richards. Richards and two friends were watching TV when Lewis and Odom, armed with a 30-30 rifle and a 12-gauge shotgun, simultaneously fired into the home. Lewis and Odom ran back to Carter, who was waiting in the van, and then they drove off. The men drove to a bridge on Trout River, where Lewis and Odom dumped their gloves and shoes into the river. Carter dumped the rifle, but took the shotgun home with him. The men dispersed after that. Lewis returned home around 10 p.m. He was living at his parents' home with his 17-year-old girlfriend. Lewis changed his clothes and immediately asked his girlfriend to dispose of them. He told her that if anyone asked, he was home all night. Back at the scene, Richard's friends had called the police. The gunfire had instantly killed Richards. The police collected bullet casings and shotgun shells from where the men had fired. Some of the casings led the police to the driver, Charles Carter. The police questioned Carter. They told him he was facing a first degree murder charge for his role in the murder. So he agreed to help the police by testifying against Lewis and Odom in exchange for full immunity. Carr told the police that Lewis and Richards were at odds over money and stolen cocaine. With Carter's information, the police recovered the shotgun and the rifle. Firearms experts matched the casings and the shells with the guns. During his murder trial in October 1976, Lewis argued that the evidence used against him was insufficient. He also claimed that Carter took part in the murder and he was an unreliable witness. Robert Lewis was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder. He was sent to death row at Florida State Prison in Rayford, Florida. On the afternoon of November 17, 1978, about two years after he was convicted, Lewis received a visit from his mother, Inyara Odom, the wife of Edward Odom. After their visit, Lewis found a prison guard's uniform left for him in the guest bathroom. Martha Ann Steinhorst purposely left the outfit for Lewis. Martha was a school teacher, and her husband, Walter Steinhorst, was also on death row. 
Walter had killed four people who stumbled upon his drug smuggling operation. The plan was to break out four death row inmates, Robert Lewis, Eddie Odom, Walter Steinhorst, and Michael Salvatore. Salvatore and two accomplices had murdered a man over money. Lewis was supposed to escape first and coordinate the escape of the other three men from the outside. The plan involved a helicopter bombing one of the guard stations. Lewis, dressed in the guard's outfit, walked to the main gate. He told the guard that his wife had been in a car accident and he had to leave. The guard, who recently started working at the prison, did not recognize him and lumped through. Lewis was picked up by an accomplice driving a dark colored 1964 automobile with temporary tags. When the prison authorities realized Lewis was missing, they alerted the police. The police immediately launched a search for Lewis. They positioned guards at the homes of people in his life. Lewis went to a motel room that Martha Steinhorst had rented. Lewis was with a man named Daniel Nelson Silva. It's unclear how Lewis and Silva knew each other or how Silva became involved in the escape plan. But he did have a criminal record, so it's possible he met the man in prison. In 1966, Silva was convicted of grand larceny. Martha, Lewis, and Silva watched the news reports about Lewis's prison escape. Silva and Lewis separated, agreeing to meet in Santee, South Carolina. Two days later, the Northern District of Florida issued a federal warrant for Lewis's capture. The FBI received a citizen's tip that Silva was going to meet Lewis at a motel in Santee. On November 28, 1978, six agents, some posing as motel workers, set up at a motel and captured Lewis when he checked in. Eleven days after his dramatic escape, Robert Lewis was back in custody. He had made the most of his time on the lam. He considered his time out of prison like going to Disneyland. While I did some catfishing, Lewis told the Florida Times Union, I just enjoyed the pure pleasure of having sunshine on me, smelling the fresh air, and drinking Coca-Cola. After his return to prison, it became known that Lewis and a group of inmates planned a more elaborate escape. For his escape, Lewis received six extra years on his sentence. Restrictions of the prison were also tightened. For example, guests and inmates were not allowed to use the same washrooms. In 1981, Robert Lewis's death sentence was overturned. He was then sentenced to life in prison. Lewis was held in the Florida prison system until 1990. While in prison, Lewis befriended Danny Rowling, who was serving time for robbery. But Rowling was actually a brutal serial killer known in the media as the Gainesville Ripper. Rowling confessed to Lewis about killing five students in Gainesville, Florida in August 1990. Lewis made a deal and exchanged his testimony and was transferred to a prison in Minnesota. Robert Fillmore Lewis died at age 53 in 2001 from Hep C. He was the first man to break out of Florida's death row. Number 1. The Backlundberg Six The Briley brothers, Linwood, James, and Anthony, were raised by their parents in Richmond, Virginia's Highland Park area. According to neighbors, the family was very close. Neighbors said that the boys helped mow lawns and fix cars. The Briley's mother worked as a food service employee at Virginia Union University. Their father was a longtime employee of a local concrete and pipe company. The three boys had an older brother, Edward. He had moved to North Carolina to live with their aunt when he was a teenager. The boys' parents separated in the mid-1970s and the three boys lived with their father in Richmond's north side. During this time, the boys had limited supervision. They spent their time collecting piranhas, tarantulas, 
boa constrictors, and Doberman pinchers. They entertained themselves by feeding mice to snakes. While their father couldn't always keep a close eye on them, he noticed changes in their behavior and it disturbed him. Their father was so unnerved by their behavior that he padlocked their bedroom doors at night. In 1971, 16-year-old Linwood shot their 57-year-old neighbor, Orline Christian, with a rifle as she hung her laundry. Christian's family initially thought she had a heart attack. But after seeing a small wound in her armpit, the family asked the funeral director to take another look. He determined that the wound was a small caliber bullet wound. Detectives determined where she was hit and traced the shot back to the Briley's house. The house was searched and the murder weapon was found. 16-year-old Linwood admitted to the shooting. I heard she had heart problems, Linwood said. She would have died soon anyway. Linwood's lawyer convinced the judge that the death was an accident. Linwood received a one-year sentence at a reform school. The third youngest brother, James, also got into trouble. In January 1973, 16-year-old James fired a gun at the police during a robbery as they pursued him. Luckily, no one was hurt. James was arrested and convicted of armed robbery and attempted murder. He was sentenced to 45 years of prison. In 1979, the brothers, now in their 20s, went on a seven-month crime spree that terrorized Richmond. When they started, James was still in prison. Sometimes they worked with a 16-year-old accomplice, Duncan Meekins. On March 12, 1979, Linwood and Anthony forced their way to the home of William and Virginia Butcher. They tied the couple up and looted the house. They doused each room with kerosene and set the house on fire. The brothers fled the burning house with their stolen items, stranding the couple inside. William Butcher managed to free himself and escape with his wife. On March 21st, Linwood and Anthony abducted Michael McDuffie, a 20-year-old vending machine serviceman. The pair robbed him, and then Linwood fatally shot him, leaving his dead body in his car. Later that month, Linwood fatally shot 28-year-old Edward Clark in a drug dispute. Meekins was present at the shooting. On April 9th, Linwood and Meekins robbed 76-year-old Mary Gowan in front of her apartment. Linwood raped her and then shot her to death. A few months later, Linwood, Anthony, and Meekins caught 17-year-old Christopher Phillips tampering with Linwood's car. It was a mistake the young man would not live to regret. The group dragged the teenager into a nearby backyard and smashed his skull with a cinder block. On August 21st, 1979, James was paroled. He joined his brothers and Meekins on their crime spree. On September 14th, the gang abducted radio DJ John Harvey Gallagher, who went by the name Johnny G, from a local dance hall. Gallagher was at the hall playing with his band. After he finished one of their sets, the gang forced Gallagher into the trunk of his Lincoln Continental. The gang took Gallagher to Mayo Island, where they shot the 62-year-old man and dumped his body in the James River. Beacons and the Briley brothers divide the $6 they found in Gallagher's wallet. A fisherman found Gallagher's body two days later. Later that month, on September 30th, 1979, the gang robbed 62-year-old nurse Mary Wilfong. Linwood used a baseball bat to break her skull. On October 6, Linwood attacked 75-year-old Blance Page with a pipe as she lay in bed. Page's roommate, 59-year-old Charles Gardner's, was also brutally murdered. When his body was found, he had knives, scissors, and a carving fork sticking out of it. 
The Browley brothers also lit a fire on his back with the yellow pages. Eight days later, Beacons got into a scuffle with 32-year-old Thomas Saunders at a gambling house. He ended up shooting Saunders to death. During the crime spree, Linwood was on parole for a robbery conviction. On the morning of October 19, 1979, Linwood told a judge he would stay out of trouble. But it was a hollow promise. Later that night, the gang forced their way into the home of 26-year-old Harvey Wilkerson, a friend of the brothers. The gang bound and gagged Wilkerson and his common-law wife, 23-year-old Judy Barden, who was eight months pregnant. Also in the home was Judy's five-year-old son, Harvey Barden. Meekins raped Judy in earshot of her common-law husband and her son, while the rest of the group collected items to steal. The gang members then covered Wilkerson, Judy, and Harvey with bedsheets. James ordered Meekins to kill one of the family members, saying, You've got to get one. Meekins shot 27-year-old Harvey Wilkerson. Then James shot 23-year-old Judy and her 5-year-old son. The gang left the family's home with James taking the family's TV. The police happened to be in the area and saw the gang fleeing, but they had no idea that they had killed the family. The bodies were discovered three days later. That's because the 11 victims all lived in different parts of the city and were from all different walks of life. So there didn't seem to be a pattern. However, the police became suspicious of Linwood after his fingerprint was found in Johnny Gallagher's car. Linwood and his brothers were put under police surveillance just before Harvey Wilkerson, Judy Barden, and Harvey Barden were killed. On October 22, 1979, after their bodies were found, the three Briley brothers and Duncan Meekins were arrested. Meekins made a plea deal with the prosecution. In exchange for a life sentence plus an additional 100 years, he would testify against the brothers. This one made him eligible for parole after 12 to 15 years. The police interviewed Linwood and he denied killing anyone. During the interrogation, a detective noticed a ring on Linwood's finger. He recognized it because it had been stolen from Johnny Gallagher. The Bradley brothers were tried separately for the different murders starting in the autumn of 1979. Anthony Briley, who never physically killed anyone, was convicted for his involvement in the murders of Harvey Wilkinson, Judy Barden, and Harvey Barden. He was sentenced to 109 years of prison, but he was eligible for parole after just 12 years. James Briley was convicted of the murders of the Bardens, and he was sentenced to death. Linwood, who was considered the ringleader, was eventually convicted of murdering Johnny Gallagher, and he was sentenced to death. He was given another five life sentences for his roles in the other murders. In early 1980, Linwood and James were transferred to Virginia's death row, which was at Mecklenburg's Correctional Center in Mecklenburg County. After four years on death row, 30-year-old Linwood and 27-year-old James planned to escape with four other death row inmates, Lem Tuggle, Eric Clanton, Derek Peterson, and Willie Jones. 32-year-old Tuggle was the oldest of the six men. In September 1971, Tuggle raped and strangled 17-year-old Shirley Brickley after an American Legion dance. He was convicted and sentenced to 20 years of prison. He was paroled in early 1983. Five months after he was paroled, in May 1983, he raped and shot 52-year-old Jesse Geneva Havens to death. Like his first victim, he met her at an American Legion dance. He was sentenced to death for the murder. 30-year-old Eric Clanton was on death row for strangling to death a 38-year-old librarian named Wilhelmina Smith in March 1981. 
23-year-old Willie Jones was on death row for a double murder he committed on May 13, 1983. He shot to death 77-year-old Graham Atkins and his 79-year-old wife, Myra, in their home. He then set their house on fire. 22-year-old Derek Lynn Peterson found himself on death row for an armed robbery that went wrong in February 1972. He shot to death Howard Kaufman, the office manager at the grocery store. The six men noticed that the death row guards were lax when it came to supervising them. On the evening of May 31st, 1984, as the inmates were being led back to their cells, Eric Clanton asked to use the washroom. Meanwhile, another inmate approached the control room, asking for a paperback book from the room. Once the door opened, Clanton burst from the washroom and overpowered the guard. After gaining control, he started pushing buttons to open the doors to the control room. From there, the inmates radioed other officers to come into the area because they wanted to ambush them. Armed with the shanks from lawn equipment, the inmates snuck up on the guards and threatened to kill them if they made any noise. Clanton dragged a female officer, Coraline Apps, into another room. She was afraid that the men would rape her. Clanton knew she was a mother. As a father himself, Clanton wanted to spare her from the violence, so he hit her. The inmates took the guards' uniforms and locked them in the closet behind the showers. The men also managed to get riot gear helmets. The men told the other guards that they had a bomb and they would defuse it once they got outside the prison. The bomb was actually a TV on a gurney covered with a bed sheet. They had sprayed it with a fire extinguisher to make it look like smoke was coming out of it. The guards believed them and let them leave the prison. Then the six men got into a prison van and drove off. They drove to the North Carolina border. Once there, the men disagreed on where to go, so they split up. The van was found abandoned in Warrington, North Carolina. The morning after the escape, Eric Clanton and Derek Pearson were also found in Warrington. Officers had driven by a laundromat and saw two men wearing prison guard uniforms. They were taken back into custody. Lem Tuggle and Willie Jones were traveling together. They were heading towards the Canadian border. Eight days after the prison break, on June 8th, Lem Tuggle was arrested in Vermont after robbing a souvenir stand. The next day, Willie Jones gave himself up to authorities in Vermont. He was about eight miles from the Canadian border. He was exhausted, cold, and had suffered a tremendous amount of bug bites. Jones had called his mother and she convinced him to give himself up. That left the two Briley brothers left on the lam. After splitting out from the other four men, they went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They had an uncle who lived there. He took them in and gave them jobs in his auto shop. The FBI looked at the call log of the brothers from prison. They noticed that they had placed a few calls to the uncle in Philadelphia in the month before the jailbreak. So the FBI put a surveillance team on the uncle's garage. They watched it for a week. Now on June 19th, they raided the garage while the brothers were eating dinner inside. They were taken into custody without incident. The brothers had been on the lam for about two and a half weeks. Before the prison break, Mecklenburg Prison was considered escape-proof. So massive changes were made around the prison. For example, death row inmates had to stay in their cells most of the day. Stairwells were blocked, cameras were installed, and limited guards were given keys to death row, and the guards were all introduced to each other. Finally, five correctional officers lost their jobs. Every one of the Mecklenburg Six were eventually executed. The brothers were executed first. 
30-year-old Linwood was executed on October 12, 1984, and 28-year-old James was executed on April 18, 1985. 33-year-old Eric Lanton was executed in April 1988. In August 1991, 30-year-old Derek Pearson's death sentence was carried out. In September 1992, 34-year-old Willie Jones was executed via the electric chair. He was the last of the men to be executed in the electric chair. In December 1996, 44-year-old Lem Tuggle was executed via lethal injection. Anthony Briley and Duncan Meekins are still in prison even though they were eligible for parole after 12 years. Meekins has been denied parole seven times since 1993. The last time was in 2019. The district attorneys who prosecuted the brothers have advocated for his parole. They think that Meekins probably regrets helping them. He might have been better off had he kept his mouth shut. It's unclear where he is currently serving his sentence. 64-year-old Anthony Briley has been denied parole at least 10 times. He is incarcerated at the Augusta Correctional Center in Staunton, Virginia. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.